a blowout, eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits on a 3-0 finish. He swings, and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone, home run, and a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flippin' Bats with your host, Ben Verlander. We are back in studio. Last episode came to you live from Denver at Coors Field in Colorado, but we are back in studio and we have a lot to talk about. I'm going to hit some storylines. I got a Twitter poll that we put out from the Flippin' Bats account. Of course, the interview with the all-star Cincinnati Reds outfielder Nick Castellanos. I can't wait for you guys to hear that. And then this week in Shohei Otani news, my favorite segment that we have here. Absolutely love it. And then uh, since we're uh, halfway through the season, we're you know in, entering the second half of the season now, we're going to go over some first half awards, my first half of the season awards. And we're going to do that towards the end of this, towards the end of the episode. But we're back in studio. I just got back from the All-Star Game a few days ago. What an absolutely incredible experience that I want to talk to you guys about. Starts when I get off the plane. Uh, it's right before the Futures Day. So I, I land there Saturday. Futures game is on Sunday. So I get there, uh, get to the hotel, get everything set up, and then get up early, uh, early Sunday for the Futures game. Uh, so that, that was a fun day, absolutely incredible. But the good stuff started coming on Monday and Tuesday. Monday was media day, uh, and that's where I got to talk to a bunch of the guys. They were kind of set up like it was like speed dating almost. Honestly, they're all sitting there in their little booths, and you go by and you talk to them all. It literally felt like I was going speed dating with all these guys, but it was so fun. First ever experience doing that. And then later in the afternoon was the Home Run Derby. So was there for that, was up on the concourse for the Home Run Derby. Uh, that was a war zone, an absolute war zone up there on the concourse. Not kidding you. Guys are hitting balls 500 plus feet, and I was up there just dodging baseballs and, and humans diving into lemon carts and stuff. You think I'm kidding, but I'm dead serious. I saw grown men dive headfirst into a lemon cart. It was nuts. Awesome, though. So cool. Uh, and then Tuesday was the All-Star Game. I uh, was back there in the stadium for the All-Star game. Man, what an awesome experience it was there in Denver. And uh, look, that leads me into my storylines. And my first storyline uh, comes from the All-Star game and the Shohei Otani experience there because, of course, that's my number one takeaway. But I'm serious, guys. This whole experience for him was legendary. Uh, he participated in the Home Run Derby. He was an all-star as a position player, as the designated hitter. He also pitched in the game. So let's just take that all in. One, this has never happened before. A guy pitching and hitting in the all-star game. Add on top of that, that he participated in the home run derby. I mean, there's, there's nothing short of, of, of amazing to say what the experience was. And being in the, experience, uh, being in the stadium and experiencing all of this happening... It is so special. I, for a long time, have been talking about Otani. So I, I, I never know like, if I'm still like, in tune with the way other people think about him. Because, look, he's, his, jersey's, his jersey's on my set. Like, I've been talking about this guy for a long time. But being in that stadium and experiencing uh, this legendary performance of doing everything, it was so special. I remember being on the concourse when he came up for the Home Run Derby. And the people next to me were saying they had the chills. And they're just, people would stand up when he'd come to the plate. This guy's not like, this guy's not a baseball star anymore. This guy's becoming like a worldwide superstar. Um, so my takeaway, uh, from, and my first takeaway from this All-Star game was the whole Shohei Otani experience. And just how special it was being there in the stadium, witnessing this, this all happening for the very first time. Um, number two, my second storyline from this past week. Look, this hasn't been talked about much, but it's something that's very interesting to me. The, the National League manager, Dave Roberts, had quite a few all-stars from the Dodgers uh, in, in this game, and, and quite a few pitchers. You know how many of those pitchers pitched? Not one. Not a single one of Dave Roberts' pitchers did he pitch in one inning. 
And look, I understand there's sometimes the pitch it doesn't line up. Uh, maybe they pitch the day or two before the All-Star game, and you don't want to use them. But not exactly what happened here in every situation. Dave Roberts playing the game a little bit here, in my opinion. Playing the game as a manager. He gets the reins to this team full of All-Stars, also full of players that he competes against every day. Those guys go out and pitch. One of those guys, Corbin Burns, who's an absolute stud of a pitcher, but he struggled in this game a little bit. He threw two innings. He threw him out there for two innings. As a guy that struggled, he let him go out and pitch a second inning. Didn't throw his guys a single inning. Saved their arms. Saved them from throwing meaningless uh, all-star game innings, which it's, it's a cool experience for everybody involved. But like I said, He's playing the game, didn't throw his guy one inning, and, and look, I, I didn't love it. I didn't love it. I would have liked him to, to use his guys that were all-stars instead of throwing a guy out there like Corbin, Corbin Burns who struggled, and he threw him out there a second inning. I don't know, man. I just, I don't know. I didn't love it. I didn't love it. I wish he would have used his pitchers. Uh, and, but that was definitely storyline number two for me. On to storyline number three from this past week, the Home Run Derby. The Home Run Derby is becoming an, an incredible spectacle that is, is must, must watch when it, when it comes to the baseball All-Star Game festivities. I couldn't have, have drawn it up better. Trey Mancini, who you know is coming back from what he's coming, you know, the cancer, uh, going through chemo, all that stuff, friend of the pod, by the way, Trey Mancini, um, made it to the finals in the home run derby. My man Shohei Otani didn't make it, didn't get out of the first round, but made it exciting. Went to a swing off, double swing off, whatever. But Trey Mancini gets there. But Pete Alonzo, Pete Alonzo is putting together a, a derby dynasty, if you will. I mean, back-to-back -back champs, but he's making it look easy at this point. Like, legitimately making it look like, he's on a different planet than these guys. I, I, said, I mentioned this a few minutes ago. I actually I was up on the concourse when Pete Alonzo was hitting in, in left field at Coors Field. And it was insane. I've never been a part of anything like that. Like, so the concourse is, is 500 feet away. I'm standing there with, you know, with my team that, that's there with me. And, and the cameras are there. And, and we're just kind of, like, taking it all in. We're soaking it all in. And we get down there. And we immediately realize we're in the middle of a war zone here. Like, legitimately, balls were flying in all different directions. People were diving into carts. It was crazy. But an incredible performance. Back-to-back -back champs. He hit 74 home runs. Pete Alonso hit 74 home runs while, look, we're, we're, we're at Coors Field. We're in Denver, the Mile High City. Mile High City. 5,280 feet above sea level. That's why, mile high, above sea level, you get it? Yeah, that's where we were. So it's a lot on you. It's a lot on your stamina. And for him to go up there and, and just dominate the way he did, a home run derby in itself is already strenuous. It's tough on you. You run out of energy. I watched Pete Alonso and then I watched it back on, on TV and the guy's just beep bopping around, just nodding his head to the music. And, and having fun, and he's stepping out of the box and pumping up the crowd. Like, this guy's on a different level when it comes to the home run derby. It's special what Pete Alonso is doing. And, and I don't even know if this is a thing. I'm making it a thing. He's creating a derby dynasty. And he said he could potentially be back next year. But look, this home run derby was awesome. Trey Mancini, Pete Alonso being there in the stadium for that happening. Absolutely uh, one of the takeaways from, from this past week and, and the All-Star Game experience. But look, speaking of home runs, we reached out to you guys on Twitter. That was actually the Twitter poll from the Flippin' Bats Pod Twitter account. So if you don't follow it, what are you doing? You got to follow it. Follow all the socials. But on Twitter weekly, we put out a poll. And this week's poll is who's going to be the home run champ at the end of the season? Who is going to lead all of baseball in home runs? We gave you... Four options, Shohei, Shohei Otani, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Fernando Tatis Jr., and someone else. And shocker here, 
Shohei Otani won the poll with 52.5% of the vote. Look, Shohei Otani currently has 34 homers. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is next at 31. So we got the poll right, I think. Somebody else got 5% of the vote. Tatis got 5.8%. So someone else um, I would think would be, um, you know, like Kyle Schwarber, who went on, a, on an absolute tear. Hopefully he comes back quickly. He's actually up there in the top, top five of the leaderboard. If he comes back and goes on a tear, you never know. But... Otani is leading this and, and, and ended up winning the poll. I, I, think we, I think we chose the right one here. Look, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is putting up an incredible season, incredible numbers. He's at 31 homers. You know what's a big key factor in this for me? The fact that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has been playing in, a, in the AAA ballpark in Buffalo, the ball flies there. I honestly think we're going to see more separation once they go back to, to Toronto, which was announced they're going back July 30th, they will be allowed back. But that stadium plays bigger. This stadium in Buffalo, oh, man. You watch games, balls are just flying out of the yard there. So I think we're going to see a little more separation, actually. And I think for that reason, we chose the right winner here. Shohei Otani wins the poll of who we think will be the leader at the end of the season. But, guys, weekly we do a poll from the Twitter uh, from the Twitter account, Flippin' Bats Pod on Twitter. And we're also on all socials at the exact same thing. So make sure you're following on Twitter to be a part of the show. Uh, so you, you can have your voice heard, and then we'll talk about it on the show. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun segment. So keep getting those votes in. Keep voting. Make sure you're following. Um, but I wanted to get into, speaking of home runs again, a guy that hits lots of homers, an all-star, a first-time all-star, just saw him in Denver, Colorado, so I'm pumped to have him on the show. A stud of a player, a stud of a human being, Cincinnati Reds outfielder Nick Castellanos. Nick, what is up, man? Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, of course, man. No problem. How's it so, going? It's good, man. We just uh, just got back. I saw you in Denver. It was your first All-Star Game experience, so congratulations on that. Um, before we get started, normally yeah, I start course, with some no trivia problem. questions, but going? I wanted how, how was the All-Star Game experience for you? What was your favorite part of the All-Star Game? Uh, my favorite part of the All-Star Game was just being able to see uh, my family react to, you know, the experience of it all. Uh, being able to walk down the purple carpet, having Liam be able to sit there and watch, uh, you know, Otani and Pete Alonzo and uh, Mancini and all these guys hit right in front of them and uh, just really being able to take it in, you know, and, and appreciate being an all-star. That's awesome. Speaking, speaking of Liam, I got a, I got a video that I want to show you put up on the screen and, and just tell me how, tell me how this video makes you feel and, and what your reaction to it is. Uh, so, I mean, that video, no matter how many times I watch it, it's just going to make me smile. Uh, but he's so, he's so happy. He's so beside himself. <laughs> um, last night, uh, la last night we actually, uh, do, is it the Dragonfly Foundation that we chose finally? Yeah, they're getting the exclusive, but that's what we chose. Uh, yeah, chose. that Liam chose. So we actually haven't told anybody yet. So this is the first place that we're saying it. So because last night we had all the list of charities at dinner and we were letting them pick. Well, he uh, researched them himself. Well, Jessica uh, made him research them uh, himself and he narrowed it down to five and kept narrowing it down. And the charity that he picked was called the Dragonfly uh it was Dragonfly Charity or Foundation? Foundation. I, want, I just want to get it right. The Dragonfly yeah. Foundation, where it deals with pediatric cancer. Um, so that's the one that Liam chose. He did it all by himself. He probably had uh, 10 or so that we read through. And this is the one that he wanted to go with. So he, for those that do not know, he drew this and it ended up on a shirt. And it's what you wore down the purple carpet. And if I'm not mistaken, it's his decision for the proceeds. He wanted them to go to charity. Is that right? So I can't make him seem that mature yet. Uh, so, 
<laughs> so the story, the, 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 what happened was, is, uh, for my birthday, uh, they were, Jess and Lee were figuring out what to get me. And, um, uh, you know, I always tell Liam that I like when he makes me stuff. I like when he, mm -hmm. uh, makes me thoughtful cards or draws me something or makes, or just makes me something, you know? Uh, and this time they, they just grabbed some uh, fabric markers and they got a white shirt and Liam drew me that shirt for my birthday. And I wore it once, like when they sang, uh, you know, and cut a cake on March 4th. And then since then I brought it to the field and it was just literally hanging in my locker. And um, just, I was just thinking about the right time. When could I wear this? When can I wear this? And, and then uh, just as the all-star game started getting closer, I was like, you know what? Like, this is when I'm going to wear this shirt. So, and that's when, and that's just when I decided and everything else started happening from there. So right after that started happening, my brother started um, hitting Jessica, my wife and saying like, Hey, there's a bunch of companies out there that are trying to jack his design and stuff for <laughs> profits. So, you know, Liam was pretty upset about that. Obviously, uh, you know, we weren't, happy with that so right. we're just like all right well let's in front of this let's do something let's let's do this and let liam be in control of it so uh that's what we did and liam ended up getting a partnership with cincy shirts uh he talked to the guy we let him basically take control of everything and uh he gets a portion of all the shirts that are sold and then you know so i said all right lee so congrats bro you did something cool so a part <laughs> of it we're going to allow him to put into a fund that we're going to put it for him. And then the other half of his percentage, all right, you got it. You have a responsibility to give back. So uh, that's when we had to teach him like what a charity was, uh, what different charities benefit um, different things. And that's when we just kind of let him make the decision. We wanted Liam to steer this as much as possible. So yeah. he really feels like it's his. That's awesome, man. What a really cool, what a really cool story. Um, all right, so got some trivia questions for you. There's a leaderboard. We got Michael Fulmer at the top of the leaderboard and Reese Hoskins. Both have eight correct. All right, so some career trivia questions. You ready? Sure. All right, 60 seconds. Who is your first career home run against? Josh Beckett. First career hit against? Duffy. First career strikeout against? Quintana. Uh, where did you bat in your first MLB at bat? Uh, I think seventh. I pinched it for Alex Avila, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Or Alex Avila was hitting. What was your jersey number in your debut? 30. Who batted behind you in your debut? Um, Omar Infante. <laughs> yeah. Where was your first away game? Uh, Boston. Who are the two starting pitchers in your debut? Um, I can't remember because I didn't start. Uh, longest career hitting streak, how long? 21. Yep, first career postseason hit against? Chen. Yep, all right, that's time. I literally, I, that is, I believe you're now our leader. The one, the, your debut was my brother and Danny Salazar. Nice. Yeah, one, That's two, right, because Austin four, Jackson five, was walking around seven. with a kink in his neck, and Tory Hunter was complaining that his Salazar was hurting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's nine. You're now our new leader. You just beat Falmer. You're at the top. Um, that's big time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you something really, really cool, like a, like a high five or a good job text message or something. <laughs> that's fantastic. I can always <laughs> use those. <laughs> um, all right, so... Nick, you were drafted and you were drafted fairly early on the draft by the Tigers, 44th overall. Um, the, the high school accolades were ridiculous. When, when, when you went through that process of should I, should I sign or should I go to Miami, was that, a tough, was that a tough call for you or were you back and forth on whether to sign or go to college? Uh, so for me, um, I, wanted, I wanted to go play baseball. You know, I went to school because, you know, kind of I had to because you have to be a student to be a part of the high school baseball team. So I knew that I wanted to <laughs> sign and play baseball. My parents, however, um, 
you know, are both very educated people. My father is a doctor. My mom has multiple master's degrees. So they understand how important education is. Um, if left up, if, if truly left up to me, I mean, as long as I was treated fairly in the draft, um, you know, I was, I was going to sign. My parents were the one that really stressed and wanted to weigh out the, you know, what really would a paid for University of Miami education be worth? So they were the ones that were more responsibly weighing out my options. But, you know, when the Tigers took me in the first round, you know, and, and I got, you know, a couple million dollars to sign, it was, it was a very easy decision because it's like, yeah. what, I'm going to go spend three years in school to hopefully get this opportunity right. again. And, you know, at the end of the day, what I wanted to do is not be a college baseball player, but to be a major league baseball player and win the World Series. Um, so it was just an easy decision for me because it was, all right, let's go get this journey started. So when you did get the journey started, you had some guys in front of you. You had Miggy. Prince Fielder were there at the corner spots and you were kind of, you, you were a third baseman and then quickly we're told, all right, we're going to, we're going to figure out this whole outfield thing. We want, we want to put you out there. Were, were you receptive to that at first? Because I know like I, I knew, I knew about you. I knew you were a stud. I knew you were an infielder. And then it's like, okay, let's figure out if you can play the outfield. Were you receptive to that at first? So I was so young and, and it was, I was receptive to everything. Uh, hold on. My wife's saying that. Nice job, Jeff. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I, so I was receptive to any, to everything. Right. Um, I was an, I was an infielder, but I wasn't a third baseman. I, you know, I love shortstop. I like playing shortstop. And then, you know, the old saying goes, uh, well, if you can play short, you can play third. And for me, that was, that was difficult just because of how, much closer I felt to the batter. Right. Um, so I played, so pretty much all the minor leagues was musical chairs for me. So my first year I played uh, in low A, I played third. My second year when we signed Tori, I played right. Uh, then we signed Tori. Uh, no, when we, when we traded for Prince Fielder, Miggy moved to third, I moved to the outfield. So I moved to right field for double A. Then we signed Tory Hunter. So then I go over and I played uh, AAA in left field. So I'm still flying through the system because I'm hitting. Right. But uh, then, and then so 13, I played left field all year. And then 14, I'm the opening day third baseman in the big leagues. And to say that I was defensively ready to play any position in the big leagues, that I wasn't, you know, just because I didn't really have any time for my defensive skills to feel comfortable or really develop anywhere at the professional level because of how fast I got to the big leagues. And, you know, then, so I, I played third for, I think what, four years, yeah. but honestly, like I never felt really comfortable there. I never got to a place where I can relax and feel confident at third base. And honestly, when they moved me to the outfield, even though I didn't know how to play the outfield when they moved me there, I was still able to relax. And I think I've just, my offense was able to take off because I'm showing up to the field more, just loose. Yeah. And uh, now it's been, so now it's been four years of me playing the outfield. And I think you're just seeing, you know, what happens when you start really feeling comfortable in, in a spot. So, you know, I said this the other day, so this is now my fourth year playing outfield. If if somebody flies through the minor leagues, they're going to play the outfield at low A, high A, double A, triple A. And in the fifth year, they're in the big leagues. And that's if everything goes fantastic. You know, you know. So right now I'm in the fourth year. And, um, you know, there's nothing like experience. When you were making that transition into the outfield, did you work with Gene Roof at all, the Tigers outfield coordinator? <laughs> I did work so, with Gene Roof. Gene so, Roof is one of my favorite human beings. I ever. love Gene Roof, and I'll never forget the first time I, I got drafted. And I, I was pitching a lot in college. I, I didn't have the experience in the outfield that a lot of people did. So I meet Gene Roof, and we're going through these outfield drills. And the first thing he ever says to me he comes up and goes, Verlander, you're allergic to the leather out there in the outfield. <laughs> and I will never forget him saying <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so how? He's, so he just texted. Go ahead. He uh, so did you know that Gene Roof retired from coaching finally? This is his first year done, and yeah, that's I just heard that recently. Yeah, 
Yeah, he sent me a he sent me a nice text uh, that you know he retired. He's you know he's home now, taking care of his wife and his family and stuff. But um, man, what a what a great what a great person, what a great coach. You know, it's it's awesome when you get uh, you know coaches in the game that really care about the well being of their players, not only like from a performance standpoint, but you know who they are and who they're going to be. And you know that's Gene Roof. Was it a tough transition for you out there? Was he like ripping you a new one every day when you were doing drills? So uh, it wasn't a tough transition, but because like it's never, I'm not one to to really stress out about stuff. Yeah. But uh, it did teach me how to work, you know, because I would literally be taking fly balls and stuff before batting practice five, six days a week and then have to go play. And, you know, he would always say the same thing, like the great ones aren't afraid to work hard. So whether or not, you know, I was learning, like a lot of times, you know, when you're 19 years old or whatever, and you have to do early work again, a lot of it, you know, you can roll your eyes and feel like you have to do it. But now being 29, uh, there's so much, there's so much value in all of that work and preparation because now being in the big leagues and, you know, having quote unquote success, uh, you still got to work hard. Speaking of working hard, I remember very well with the with the Tigers, you at a at a young age. I mean, you're still young, but you were much younger at the time. There was one off season where you came back and you were jacked. You were built different. You had this like different persona about you. And it, it kind of like your career took off from there. What what? What went on that off season for you in your head just to come back and say, you know what, I'm going to work. I can do this. And you came back and you looked different. You were built different. You had different swag about you and you just started raking and your career took off. Was there something that happened that off season and, and with your mindset? I got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was, you know, that was a really big, uh, growing moment for me. Uh, you know, I was in uh, a relationship with my son's mother and, um, you know, it ended up not working out, uh, nobody's fault, but just, it, it wasn't right. And, um, you know, that was the first time since I was 17 years old, you know, that I was now just only responsible for myself and looking in the mirror. And I didn't, the only opinion that, uh, really mattered to me again was my own. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of went to work on, all right, who do I, who do I want to be? All right. How does that person carry himself? How does that person walk around? How does that person talk? How does that person think? Yeah. How does that person handle failure? You know, uh, how does that person handle success? What kind of dad is that person? Uh, and, you know, I've just consistently since I've been even like, that was the first time I was able to think like that. And then after now you're able to think like that. Now it's, now it's just the creating the disciplines to be able to walk and make that imagination come to life. Wow. So you, you go through that transformation. You, you, know, you become a super successful big league. You're still playing in Detroit. And I, for those that don't know, the right center field in Detroit is enormous, like almost unfairly ridiculous. And you're a guy that likes to hit the ball the other way and drive the ball the other way. And I remember you saying a few times that that stadium was holding you back. And then, and then you move on to Wrigley and now you're with the Reds and you could not have been more right. That, I mean, you, you, you just flourished when you finally left there. Is, is that true? Like you, you like to drive the ball the other way and then you leave and now all this success happens that, and you know, your, your power numbers are through the roof. Do you think that's a big reason why? Of course. Um, you know, that it, it's, it's really, I mean, yeah, a hundred percent is true. Uh, my swing is tailored more towards the middle of the field. And I think that since 2017, uh, I was like leading major league baseball in barreled outs. And I think outs over 400 feet, you know, because when I, when I hit a ball, right, it's, it's to left center or right center. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the six years that I played there, I hit one home run to right center and I hit two home runs, uh, no, one home run to center and two home runs to right center. So, you know, it took me three years to get three balls 
out of there. And then, you know, going to Wrigley, coming to Cincinnati, uh, you know, and then you're able to stay inside the ball and hit it to the middle of the field and you get rewarded. So now what's a beautiful thing is that um, hitting is all confidence. So when you see and when you feel the uh, the uh, benefits of like, you know, success and you, you're confident and you see your scoreboard numbers and everything, you know, you can just start to relax a little bit and start really trusting your talent. And I think that uh, that's kind of just what happened because it's not like I've, I've Yes, I've, I've continued to tune my swing and become more uh, secure with who I am and how I think. And, you know, all right, Nick, like you're going good. Like this is how you've handled in the past. And all right, Nick, this is you're not going so good. And this is how you've handled it in the past. So obviously there's a lot of maturity uh, that's happened because it's my eighth year. But also to say that uh, not playing 80 games in Comerica hasn't <laughs> helped my uh, numbers would be lying. You know, just like when Donaldson went over to Toronto. Yeah. Uh, so, so you mentioned something there that jogged my memory. And, and I talk about this a lot because I, I experienced it in the minor leagues. And the mentality when it comes to baseball, can it can eat you alive, the mental game. And this is where I struggled was when I go through a rough stretch and you start seeing those numbers on the scoreboard dwindling down with every at bat. I, I never like learned how to cope with that and to get out of it and to not focus on it. What, what do you do that allows you mentally to be locked in and not worry about that? And if you go through an 0 for 4, 0 for 8, 0 for 15 stretch where you can continue to have success because I never could learn that. I never figured it out. So that's when, that's when you really have to have something else that you believe in uh, besides um, – statistics so like that's when you really have to for me you know i have i have a uh, a workout regimen in the weight room that i really take pride in and it's just as important to me as whether or not i get hits that day you know i have wow. uh um there's even the way that i eat there's you know now that nutrition is something that's really important for me if i if i win the day in the weight room i win the day with the food that i eat i win the day with my offensive pre preparation and i win the day with uh, really focusing on doing everything I can to get a W, whether it's beating out a double play, whether it's going first to third, whether it's scoring on a double, whether it's getting a ball in quickly from the right field corner, uh, anything that you can drop in the bucket to be productive, that makes it a win. So when I was younger, you know, everybody, it's easy just to get locked up on the simple things. Like, did I get a hit? Did I get a double? Did I drive somebody in? Did I hit a home run? Did I, you know, what's my average today? Right. Am I hitting over 300? And obviously those are very easy um, traps to fall into because that's what almost everybody's taught to focus on. Right. But it was just, yes, those are important, but it's not what should dictate how well you sleep at night. Yeah. Um, well, I know you don't have a huge presence on social media and you don't have Twitter, but are you aware that you've hit some home runs that have like at the most bizarre times that have sent social media and Twitter into a frenzy? When, when do you find that out? Because I know you don't have Twitter, but it's, it's becoming comical at this point. How many home runs you're hitting at weird times? So... <laughs> I find it out pretty uh, instantaneously because my family just absolutely lets me know everything that I do immediately after I do it. So uh, my brother usually keeps me posted with everything that's going on in the social media world. And um, I think that is pretty coincidental that that stuff that happened on in Kansas city, you know, like what are the chances, you know, two like kind of awkward moments when I happen to hit a home run pretty much in the same spot while this is going on. But you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, all right, Nick. So I, I've always wanted to ask you this. I've always known you, you have a flip phone. Why at this point? Why? Why do you still have a flip phone? Well, so everybody is different. But for me, uh, I know where I want to be. Uh, I want to be um, first and foremost uh, known as a great baseball player. I also want to be known as a winner. And the reality of my career is that I've played over a thousand games in the big leagues on to, only to lose five games in the postseason, you know? And um, 
I don't know. Like, I just, I had this thought that like, all right, if, if it's going to, if, if you're going to be able to do this, it's going to take all of your focus. It's going to take, uh, it's going to take pretty much everything you got to be able to do this. And I felt like getting rid of my smartphone and minimizing my distractions and lessening the number of people that I talk to, um, will allow what's really important just to take more precedent and, um, you know, and kind of simplify my life a little bit. So I'm able to repeat what I want each and every day. And, um, you know, I'm not saying a smart or a flip phone is the answer, but I do find that my life is simple, more simple, um, happier, um, more fulfilling, the less time that I look at screens. Yeah. So, and, and you mentioned it, you played over a thousand big league games only to lose five games in the playoffs. And, and now you're, you're in Cincinnati. And I feel like the writing is on the wall with this team. Like the, the, the core is there for you guys to win games. And, and is that part of why you, you're in Cincinnati? Because you like this team is ready to win. We're a few pieces away and we can do this. Well, for sure. When I, when I made that decision, uh, to sign over there, we had a couple choices, um, to pick and Cincinnati was ultimately the one that, um, I decided to go to because, you know, knowing that division and knowing the pitching staff at the time that we had, um, also the, the, the veteran bats that were in that lineup, I really thought that my best, uh, still do think that my best chance to win, uh, and really go far in the postseason and be able to experience, uh, October baseball was in Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, I have some career moments questions for you that I ask everybody just about your career. Um, the first would be, what was your welcome to the big leagues sort of moment? Um, I think my home run off Josh Beckett. That's sick. My home run off Josh Beckett was a pretty cool full circle moment for me just because of growing up a Marlins fan, watching him pitch in the World Series, throw on short rest, the complete games, everything. So, like, he was a hero um, in our house as a Marlins fan, had the sports clippings up in our in our sports <laughs> room and everything. So, you know, playing pool with my friends all throughout high school, we'd see the pictures of Josh Beckett and everything. And so to be able to uh, – have my first home run against somebody that we've idolized was a really cool experience. What's your favorite play that you've made on the field? Um, my favorite play that I've made on the field. Uh, there's a couple plays that I've ran up in the outfield, just making some good catches up against the wall. Um, also throwing some people. Any, anytime you throw somebody out at the plate, uh, is fantastic. Yeah, you got a sneaky arm, plays. by the way. You, you got a sneaky arm. It, it's in there. Uh, I would just say that I'm at, that I'm accurate, you know, and I have a good, like Gene Roof would say, like I just I have a good long hop. So like once it hits the floor, it doesn't die. It kind of just skips, skips to where it's got to go. Yeah. So you know, I don't I don't have a cannon, but I think I'm able to get rid of it and you know put it in the vicinity where it needs to be. And uh, what would be your favorite moment that's taken place with teammates off of the field in your career? Uh, my favorite moment off the field, I would say uh, cruising around the Chicago River with Jason Hayward is probably my uh, favorite off the field moment. Um, the cruising the Chicago River at night is probably my favorite thing to do in the United States. Uh, of America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining me, man. Um, congratulations on the all-star game. Tell Liam, I said, hello. Tell Jess, I said, hello. We're going to, we're going to blow Liam's shirt up again and, and talk about it a bunch. So thank you so much and, and good luck the rest of the way. Fantastic. Thank you guys. Of course, man. See ya. Man, what an awesome interview. I just wanted to thank again Nick Cassianos for joining me. Look, we're not in the business of, of breaking news here. That's not my thing. That's not what this show is about. We don't really break a bunch of news, but we were able to with that conversation I just had with Nick where he said half of the proceeds from Liam's shirt are going to the Dragonfly Foundation, which that whole thing was awesome. The fact that he drew that shirt for his dad's birthday and and nick wore it on the purple carpet at the all-star game 
so cool. And what an awesome story of, of him donating half the proceeds. So uh, the Dragonfly Foundation is where that's going. It's a nonprofit based out of Cincinnati. So a uh, really cool story there. But it is time for this week in Shohei Otani news. My favorite segment we have here. My favorite player. Love everything about the guy. Um, look, it starts with what he did at the All-Star Game. The first player in history to be an All-Star as a hitter and as a pitcher. Not only that, he also participated in the Home Run Derby and was the first Japanese-born player to participate in the Home Run Derby. The whole experience here for him was something that uh, I've never experienced. I've, I've watched a lot of baseball. I've been around a lot of players. I've never experienced um, th what he brought to the All-Star Weekend. You also know what he brought to the All-Star Weekend? I met him. I finally met Shohei Otani. It was the biggest moment of all time. I walked off of meeting him and I said, I just met Babe Ruth. He's better than Babe Ruth. It's absolutely incredible. And, and it was, it was special. It was special meeting him. I've, I've, you know, just, I've been around the game for a long time with my brother being nine years older than me. And so I've had the, the pleasure of meeting so many players, but this was so different. This is really different. Just being around him, um, I don't really know how to explain it, but um, it was really cool. A really cool moment for me, a really cool moment in my life, being able to meet somebody uh, that I, I care so much about and that I talk so much about. So awesome there. He's just, he's a really good person. And I, I think more so than anything, that's why, you know, I, I love what he does on the field and I love the person he is off of the field. And speaking of the person, that he is, he participated in the Home Run Derby, and before he even started, uh, he agreed to give away the proceeds he made from the Home Run Derby to about 30 of the staff members from the Angels. Look, it's, it's so cool to me. Otani is on a contract right now that being able to, to step back now and look at it is, a, is ridiculous. He's, he's one of the best players in all of baseball. He's taking the world by storm. He's, he's doing all of this with, with endorsements and, and everything. He's becoming the face of baseball in front of our eyes. And I've talked about this before. I, I believe Fernando Tatis is emerging as the face of baseball. But, but out in the front of our eyes, this guy has, has taken that over and has taken the world by storm and has gotten people that don't like baseball into baseball. And, and I can't think of a better face of baseball than somebody that's bringing new people into the game. Now look, he participates in the Home Run Derby. He, he, he gets $150,000 and he donates it to Angels staff members. How cool is that, man? Like all, all the people that are walking around, his communication staff, uh, people that are just in the front office with the Angels, he donates it and spreads out the $150,000 amongst those people and gives money back to them. Just, just awesome, man. He's, he's not only the one, of, one of the best players in baseball, if not the best player in baseball right now, but he is such a good human being. So what an awesome thing for him to give away that money. And speaking of giveaways, uh, I was able to go to the Shohei Otani bobblehead night. First night back, first game of the second half is Shohei Otani bobblehead night. Uh, and I was there in attendance. I got myself a bobblehead. I was there three hours early thinking I'd be fine. I wasn't fine at all. There were so many people. I was freaking out that I wasn't going to be able to get it. I was actually really nervous about it, but I was able to get in and able to get a bobblehead. And it was such a fun night at the ballpark. The ballpark's packed, by the way. It's an Angels game. And it's packed. We, uh, I was actually talking to a fan before the game. He was an older gentleman that has been a season ticket holder since the 70s. And he comes up and he, he's talking to me. And he says, you know what? This, this just feels different. This feels different. I've been in this stadium a long time. I've been here for Nolan Ryan, no hitters. And it feels different right now. Watching Otani come up to the plate, watching him do what he does, I've never felt that in this stadium. 
And he says, trust me, I get it. I'm a huge Mike Trout fan. He's one of the top five of all time, in his opinion, also in my opinion. But he said it doesn't hold a candle to what Otani is bringing to the stadium right now, what he's bringing to the Angels, which was pretty cool to hear. Um, so it was really awesome being in that stadium that night, and, and I was able to get a bobblehead. But look, I want to give my bobblehead away, and, and I'm doing a giveaway, and, and there's a tweet on the Flippin' Bats Pod Twitter account where you just got to go take a screenshot of, of giving the Flippin' Bats podcast on, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify a five-star review um, or just that you're following it if, it, if it's on Spotify. And, and I want to give my bobblehead away. You, you guys mean so much to me, and this show means so much to me. And, and a lot of my show is it's talking about o- Otani and how awesome he is for the game of baseball. And I love what he does with giveaways like that. And I know this isn't on the scale of being able to give away $150,000, but it is something cool to me that I want to give to you guys for for caring and listening. So there is a Shohei Otani bobblehead giveaway. The bobblehead is right here. I will be giving this away. So go on the Twitter account, find the tweet, um, and you have until Friday to to quote tweet it and, and just prove, take a screenshot that you uh, have reviewed the show five stars, given it a five star review. Uh, So make sure if you haven't done that, you do that. And if you want the bobblehead, there's certainly a way for you to get it and I will be giving it away. Um, So yeah, what an awesome week. What a crazy week for this week in Otani News. I met him. I finally met him. I've been talking about him for so long uh, and to be able to meet him in that moment was was awesome and 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 something in a moment that I will never forget. And speaking of Shohei Otani, seems like the perfect segue into my awards, my first half awards of the season. And I'm gonna start with the AL MVP from the first half. And it is of course Shohei Otani. Look, what he is doing this year. Is, is, is I talk about all the time. We know the numbers. He's got 34 home runs. He leads the league. He's also a pitcher with a sub 3.5 ERA. So my first half MVP, without a doubt, without a doubt, is Shohei Otani. Uh, what he's doing on the field is special. What he's doing for the game of baseball is special. Leading the league in homers. So without a doubt, this one was easy for me. Um, Look, I honestly believe we could get to a point where Vladimir Guerrero Jr. could win the Triple Crown and not win MVP. How crazy would that be? I'm not saying he is going to win the Triple triple Crown because I'm not positive and I don't think his numbers are going to be as great when they move up to Toronto, but how crazy would that be if he won the Triple Crown and Otani still won MVP, which I think is possible and and would happen. Uh, But on to the National League side of things. My first half MVP from the National League was Jacob deGrom. Look, this one for me, if you, before the season started, this would have been a surprise. But once we got into it, the guy's putting up numbers that have, have never been seen before in baseball. Not only is this a brilliant year for a pitcher, this is the best season to this point that we have ever seen from a pitcher. So look, what Fernando Tatis out in San Diego is doing is fantastic. Um, And without DeGrom, he's for sure the MVP to this point. But we have DeGrom. And he's putting up numbers that we have never seen. He's put up the best first half for a pitcher of all time and is on pace to break the all-time record for the best ERA we've ever seen in a season. So look, if that happens, 100% 100% the MVP and, and would just be an awesome story. My concern is his health. And I've said this a few times this year and it just seems like he keeps going on the IL with these little like these little nagging injuries. And he's out right now. He missed a start this week because of a, of a forearm strain or, or some issue with his arm. And that scares me. That scares me because as a fan of baseball, I want to see him do as well as he can. I want to see him break all these records. I think it'd be awesome. So hopefully it's just a little nagging 10 day injury and he gets back in a few days and is back to to putting up the numbers he is. So 
first half National League MVP, Jacob deGrom. On to the Cy Young Award, and we'll start in the American League. And we're gonna start with Lance Lynn. He is my winner for Cy Young in the first half. Friend of the show, Lance Lynn, who is on and uh, had an awesome conversation with him. Look, the guy has a sub two ERA right now, and, and, and it just squeaks under, it's at a 199. But look, it still counts. I'm not wrong by saying sub two. And honestly, this was a tough one for me. It was a toss up between him and his teammate, Carlos Rodon. Back and forth these guys are going, and, and it's just an incredible year. And, and I ended up going with Lynn because he was on here and, and he gets an edge, but hopefully Rodon's on soon. That'd be cool. But look, sub two ERA, uh, just, signed a, just signed an extension. What an awesome like resurgence in this guy's career. Won a World Series in, uh, early on in his career with the Cardinals in 2010, I believe and then you know continues on and is, is now pitching the best he ever has in his career in my opinion so first half al cy young award winner is lance lynn on to the national league cy young award look if i'm gonna give him the mvp you know who the national league cy young award is and it's jacob de grom without a doubt jacob de grom to this point look he's doing something special like i said he's also has a chance to be the third pitcher ever since 1992 great year i was born that year fantastic year love that year third person ever to win the mvp and the cy young award in the same season two other people have done it clayton kershaw and some guy named justin verlander who's also pretty cool who i happen to love very much so jacob de grom could be the third pitcher uh, since 92 to win the AL or to win the MVP and the Cy Young Award in the same season. So obviously if I pick him to win the MVP, I'm gonna pick him to win the Cy Young. And that's just what I did right here. Now on to the last award we have the rookie of the year. And we will start in the American League with Adolis Garcia, the outfielder for the Rangers that is just hitting homers and bunches. One of the coolest, one of the coolest stories this year, in my opinion. The guy just comes out of nowhere had never hit a home run before this year. Well, not never, I'm sure he's hit a home run at some point in his life. I, I gotta believe he's hit a home run at some point in his life. But never hit a big league home run before in his career and just comes on the scene and for a while is at the is top two in the league in hitting homers. Uh, rookie putting up awesome numbers, was an all-star. I believe he has 22 home runs to this point in the season. Uh, so just awesome, and in my opinion, uh, right now, unless something drastically changes in the second half, Adolis Garcia is your AL Rookie of the Year. And moving on to National League Rookie of the Year, another all-star, by the way, Trevor Rogers of the Miami Marlins. Brilliant pitcher, absolutely awesome, having an awesome year on the mound. I actually caught up with him at the All-Star game and talked to him for a second because he had a funny moment a few weeks ago, or like a week ago when his manager called him in and said he was, how he was told he's gonna to be an all-star, but they told him he was getting sent down. So, and as a rookie, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I get it, I guess I'm gonna save my arm. Um, but he ends up becoming an all-star. I talked to him about that situation. Um, the guy's just got electric stuff. And, and, you know, in my opinion right now, the Rookie of the Year awards are kind of pulling themselves away from the, from the pack, if you will, Garcia and Trevor Rogers. So, both all-stars, both names that I need you guys to start remembering because they're going to be around for a long time. They're two studs of the game and uh, really awesome to see them be able to, to be at the all-star game as rookies. And that does it for my first half awards. We went over MVP, Cy Young, Rookie of the Year. That does it for the awards. Uh, we are launching now into the second half of the season. Speaking of launching, wanted to bring up one other point before I get going here. Um, a, a fan at Yankee Stadium launched a ball into the outfield at, uh, at a Red Sox outfielder, Alex, Alex Verdugo. And look, I didn't know if I wanted to talk about this because obviously you can't be doing that. Listen here, as a fan, don't do something that is dumb. Very easy. I really believe in you fans. You can do this. Just don't do dumb things. And what is dumb is launching a baseball at an opposing player. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I feel like it got handled correctly. 
by Major League Baseball. You know what Major League Baseball did? They banned the fan for life. Not just from Yankee Stadium, not just from Red Sox-Yankees games, from every stadium ever, you cannot go. So that's why I wanted to talk about this. Just do the right thing in the stands. They're all players, they're all humans. We don't need to be chucking baseballs at players and potentially hurting them. But the reason I wanted to talk about this is because it did happen and baseball handled it correctly and is, is banning the guy for life. And I absolutely love that about this. They handled it the right way. And uh, I think that's awesome. So um, before I head out, I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the feedback that I got from you guys, fr from the All-Star Game. And look, I played this game for a long time. I know a lot about this, the game of baseball. But at the end of the day, I love this game. I love the game so much. It is my life. It is my passion. And hearing you guys message me and say things like, I really wasn't interested in this until I saw your enthusiasm for it. Or I get to watch you and it doesn't look like you're working. It looks like you're just having fun bringing us content. That's the coolest thing in the world to me is hearing you guys say that because that, that is truly how I feel. I, I, I love this game. I am a fan of this game. Um, and, and to hear your feedback in, in regards to that, was, was some of the coolest stuff. I, I loved being at the All-Star Game and loved bringing you guys everything I did and worked my absolute tail off with my team to bring you guys everything we did. But it was so fun, and I had so much fun, and hearing your guys' response to that uh, was awesome. So thank you for the kind words. Keep getting those in. Keep voting five stars and commenting on uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, and just, just qu uh, send the screenshot to the Flippin' Bats Pod tweet, and you can end up with this bad boy, the bobblehead, right here. It can be yours. Uh, so thank you guys so much for listening to this post-All-Star Game, first post-All-Star Game episode. Check out the podcast. Make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and make sure you're following along on social media, at Flippin' Bats Pod on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, we have a YouTube channel that's growing with all the YouTube uh, content and Shohei Otani stuff. And every episode comes out via video on there. So uh, make sure you check that out. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. I wanted to thank Nick Cassianos again. And we will see you next time on Flippin' Bats. It's a blowout. Eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out a three -hole. Swings and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run and a huge backflip to celebrate.